You're watching Saturday Anime on the Sci-Fi Channel. Greetings, this is Reverend Paul, and this, of course, is Studio Chojin Raw. Today, we're going to be talking about Project Aiko, and let's just get right to it. Project Aiko is an anime film that was released in 1986. It was directed by Katsuhiko Nishijima, and it was also written by Nishijima, along with Tomoko Kawasaki and Yuji Moriyama. Yuji Moriyama also served as the character designer for the film, and he was also the animation director for the film. Project Aiko is about Aiko Megami and her best friend, Seiko. And in a lot of ways, Eiko and Seiko are your typical high school girls. They have to deal with a lot of problems most high schoolers could relate to. They're perpetually late for class. There's another student in the class who's a complete asshole to them. Their teacher is always yelling at them. In a lot of ways, Project Eiko is a slice of life anime in the sense that it's an anime about the daily lives of these characters. It's about Eiko and Seiko and all the crazy stuff they have to put up with in high school. But you see, there is a twist here because Eiko and Seiko don't live in the same version of reality you and I do. Eiko and Seiko live in a heightened version of reality. In fact, the city they live in, Graviton City, was destroyed 16 years earlier by an alien spaceship and the city had to be rebuilt. And the city now is this technological marvel. It's a city with advanced technology. It's a city with mechs. And this plays into the challenges Eiko must deal with in her daily life because the challenges she has to deal with are mechs trying to kill her and aliens trying to invade the world. Project Aiko really is one of the fucking craziest animes you will ever see in your life. It's a mishmash of all different kinds of anime genres. It's part comedy, part action, part sci-fi. And it's really hard to explain the plot of this film because it does start off as your typical anime high school fair, but then it just goes into the fucking craziest directions. Because what I also have neglected to mention is that Aiko is a girl with superpowers. She has super strength and super speed and she can leap tall buildings in a single bound. More on that later. And sure, like a lot of high schoolers, she's late for school, but she also has super speed. So she is able to fucking grab Seiko and run fucking Mach 1 as fast as she can to get to school and cause all kinds of destruction in her way. Now, I also mentioned that Aiko has to deal with a lot of drama one might find in high school, but Project Aiko does kind of take this idea and twist it up and make it so absurd because you see the real plot of Project Aiko is in Aiko and Seiko's class is another girl named Biko and you see Biko is jealous of Seiko and Aiko's relationship and she wants to steal Seiko away from Project Aiko and make her her best friend slash lover it's really not that clear how far Biko's affection goes for Seiko I tend to think she probably wants to get it on with Seiko but the movie doesn't explicitly say that it just lets me imagine that in my fucked up imagination. Um, so Biko is trying to steal Seiko away from Eiko and she does this by inventing mechs to fight Eiko. And this is where this show really excels in just being so fucking absurd and just amplifying the action over and over and over again. Every day Eiko goes to school, Biko has a new mech for her to fight. First, it's just a simple mech suit. Biko takes one of her friends and puts her friends in a mech suit and then Aiko fucking destroys it with no problem. After Biko's first attempt to beat Aiko fails, Biko then builds another mech and the next mech Biko makes is a transforming mech and it is much more advanced than the first mech that she made. What I love about this sequence is that it starts off with the mech in car form and we see Biko's friend piloting the mech in the cockpit. Then the mech transforms into its robot form and then when the film cuts into the cockpit to show Biko's friend again, she's all twisted and the controls are all over the place. I love the fact that this show addresses the idea that when a mech transforms, there's no reason for the controls in the cockpit to stay in the same place. That's something they never talk about in other mech shows. With all the shifting of parts and moving different sections of the mech, how do they keep the controls and the cockpit in the same place? And why doesn't anything change? <laughs> there's no reason for everything to stay in the same place. It actually makes complete sense that when the mech transforms, the cockpit it would be completely fucked up. So once again, Aiko destroys the mech Biko makes. Then, since her first two attempts to beat Aiko failed, Biko decides she needs to up her game. Rather than building a 
another mech, or rather than building another transforming mech, on the third day, Aiko and Biko fight. Biko builds five giant mech robots, and she calls them the Arashiyama 5. And this time, she is certain that the Arashiyama 5 will beat the shit out of Aiko, but Biko's mechs are no match for Aiko and her superpowers. I mean, she fucking beats the shit out of these fucking five giant mechs with no fucking problem whatsoever. And this action sequence is so awesome. It is so beautifully animated. I love the way Aiko kind of jumps between the mechs and this shot right here where Aiko kind of shields herself as the explosion happens behind her. It's such a great little detail and little attention to details like that really make the action sequences in Project Aiko really unique. So at this point, Aiko has now beaten every single mech Biko has thrown at her. And this is where the story starts to get even crazier because now Biko is determined to beat Aiko. And since she has beaten the best of everything she made, Biko rips off her clothes and she is wearing an armored mech suit that is called the Akagiyama 23. And then Biko and Aiko start to fight all throughout the school. And this fight sequence is awesome. The Aiko and Biko fight sequence to me is what anime is all about. It's two hot chicks, one with superpowers, one in a badass mech suit, and they're having the fucking most kick-ass fight sequence you've ever seen. This fucking rules. And I love the fact that Biko's power suit is one part power suit, but like five parts dominatrix outfit. You definitely get the idea that the black metal of the suit is meant to invoke the black leather of like a fucking dominatrix. And this mech suit perfectly fits who Biko is, and it perfectly encapsulates who she is as a character. This is why she is so fucking cool. And this fight sequence, just like the mech sequence, starts to progress into just absurd territory, where at first they're fighting hand to hand, they're breaking through the walls in the school, then their fight gets into the city, and then Aiko and Biko start throwing tanks and fucking spider mechs at each other. Then an alien invasion comes, and it completely ruins the battle they were having, because you see, in another strange twist of fate, Seiko is actually a princess from another planet, and the aliens have come to kidnap Seiko, and now Aiko and Biko, the two rivals, must now join forces to save Seiko. And this action sequence with the alien invasion is also really awesome, where we see Aiko and Biko fighting the different ships, and then there's that one sequence that I really love, where Aiko is jumping on the jets and then hopscotching across the missiles. Like, that is one of the classic moments in the history of anime, as far as I'm concerned. Now, I also think it's worth mentioning that Project Aiko is a lot more than just an exhibition and how crazy anime could be. Project Aiko is also a celebration of anime. In a lot of ways, Project Aiko is the first meta anime because there are a lot of references to other anime in this film. The first one that strikes me is Macross. You could definitely see the influence of Macross in the ship designs, which is no coincidence because the mech designs and the ship designs in Project Aiko were done by Shoichi Masuo, who is also a mech designer in Macross. Project Aiko also references Captain Harlock with the character Captain Napoli Pololita, who is a complete drunk. I mean, Captain Harlock enjoys a glass of wine every now and again, but Captain Napoli Polita is a fucking drunk who is constantly hitting the fucking booze. We also see references to Fist of the North Star with the character Mari. And the teacher of the class, Misayumi, is actually a reference to Magical Angel Creamy Mommy. There's also a great sequence when Eiko and Siko go to the movies, and we could see Ten-Chan from Yurisei Yatsura sitting in the audience, and the movie Eiko and Siko are watching is actually a parody of Harmageddon Genma Tyson with Colonel Sanders standing in for the cyborg. This is awesome. I love this scene. Even the title of Project Aiko is a reference in itself. The title of Project Aiko is meant to be a reference to the Jackie Chan movie Project A. The film also reveals at the end that the reason Aiko has superpowers is because she is actually the daughter of Superman and Wonder Woman. And in the second film, we find out that Biko is the daughter of Tony Stark, which is why she has access to all these mechs and mech suits. So not only is Project Aiko extremely meta and parodying and satirizing all these different aspects of other animes, it's also one of the first comic book crossovers in a movie. And the ending of Project Aiko with the alien invasion actually feels a lot like the Avengers. I mean, Project Aiko is really ahead of its time. And it's a movie that's aged extremely well. It's a movie that is much more relevant now than it was when it first came out. Because everything Project Aiko is parodying are things that have become basic superhero tropes that we see in a lot of Marvel movies. I mean, it is pretty incredible when you look at the ending of this movie because the ending of Project Aiko is pretty much parodying the first Avengers 
Avengers movie before the first Avengers movie even existed. It was so weird rewatching this movie because it really is incredible how well the jokes and satire have held up. Another thing I think is really cool about Project Echo is that it started off as an installment in the Cream Lemon series. Now, if you're not familiar with the Cream Lemon series, Cream Lemon is almost like the 80s hentai version of the Red Shoe Diaries, which I'm really fucking dating myself <laughs> by using that analogy. If you're from the fucking 90s like me, you know what the fucking Red Shoe Diaries are. You kids really don't know how fucking good you have it today. I can't throw a rock on the fucking internet without accidentally stumbling into a buffet of boobs. Back in the 90s was like living in a boob desert where there was just no access to boobs. The only hope you had was to hopefully stay up late on a weekend and hopefully you can catch some boobs on Showtime while watching the Red Shoe Diaries. The Red Shoe Diaries was the go-to source for boobs for a lot of 90s teenagers. <laughs> Anyway, I digress. Like the Red Shoe Diaries, the Cream Lemon series was a hentai anthology series where each episode was about a different group of characters and the sexual escapades they would embark on. It's a really cool old school hentai show. And that was where the idea for Project Echo began. Originally, Project Echo was going to be a hentai and it was going to be one of the Cream Lemon films. And the team behind Project Echo, Katsuhiko Nishijima and Yuji Moriyama, were actually animators on the Cream Lemon series. And you could even get an idea of what the hentai version of Project Echo would have been like if you watched the Cream Lemon episode Pop Chaser, which also features character designs by Yuji Moriyama. And the plot to Pop Chaser is actually very similar to Project Echo, where there's a girl who's new in town and she meets another girl and falls in love. And then that girl gets kidnapped. And then the hero girl has to then fight all these different mechs to save the girl that she loves. I mean, it's basically basically the prototype for Project Echo, and it really gives us a sense of what the hentai version of Project Echo would have been like. Now that I think of it, Project Echo could be a sequel to Pop Chaser, because you see the bartender from Pop Chaser and some of the girls that work in the bar make a cameo appearance in the classroom during Biko and Echo's fight sequence. So it is entirely possible that Pop Chaser takes place in Graviton City before it was rebuilt. <laughs> I actually think that's pretty cool. Pop Chaser is definitely definitely tonally consistent with Project Echo, not just because like Project Echo, it's a sci-fi action story, but in the sense that Project Echo also has some hentai elements to it as well. I think most notably with Biko. A lot of the scenes of Biko at her house, Biko in the private bath, Biko in her bedroom, all feel like scenes that could have been ripped out of Cream Lemon. I have to say Biko is my favorite character in Project Echo. I love the fact that she's pretty much a Cream Lemon girl pulled out of Cream Lemon and put into the sci-fi world of Project Echo. I also think Biko is the fucking hottest chick in Project Echo. I don't understand why Biko is obsessed with Seiko. I feel like she can get a much hotter chick. Honestly, I think Biko should hook up with Echo. I'd love to see a fucking Biko and Echo hentai movie. I think that would be awesome. Why Biko is in love with Seiko and not Echo is beyond me. I like to think in my own twisted imagination that Biko loves Seiko, but she's also into Echo and she's using Seiko as as this kind of gateway to get to Aiko so they could have this epic threesome orgy and that would be so cool. Biko is also a great character because she is the character with the most vulnerability and relatability. Aiko and Seiko have each other. They're two friends who hang out and they're having a good time and Aiko is indestructible. She could fucking beat anything. But Biko is a lot different. You know, she has to make mechs in order to be competitive with Aiko and she also is a very lonely person. She doesn't really have a best friend it seems like. It doesn't feel like she has a real connection with her henchmen. In that regard, it really makes Biko a very interesting and vulnerable character. Something I think is worth pointing out is the fact that I think it was pretty intentional for the creators of Project Echo to set the events of this film in high school and have the main characters be high school characters. Because even though it is this ridiculous sci-fi action show where it does feel like the plot of this film is just one big non sequitur where just random shit is happening, a lot of this movie does 
kind of feel analogous to what it's like being a teenager, <laughs> where everything is over the top and ridiculous. When you're a teenager, everything feels like the end of the world. Every problem feels like the biggest problem you'd ever face in the world. And I feel like this idea is encapsulated with the story of Project Aiko. I mean, Aiko is a girl who is dealing, who is literally dealing with these world ending problems. And it is very much analogous to how a teenager feels. So if we were going to be really generous, you could look at Project Aiko as a metaphor of a teenager overcoming all the world ending problems they have to deal with in their own teenage life. Learning how to overcome the different obstacles that present themselves and learning how to deal with all these different like social problems within the classroom. Who's trying to steal your friend away? Who's jealous of you because you know you have something that they want? These are all ideas that even though they're presented in this ridiculous context in Project Aiko, at the core, these are all very relatable problems. So in a lot of ways, even though it's this ridiculous over the top action movie, it does share a lot of themes with a typical high school show. Now I mentioned the character designs for Project Aiko were done by Yuji Moriyama. And honestly, I think the style is awesome. I love the character designs in Project Aiko. I love the big anime hair. I love how expressive the characters faces are. I mean, this is all stuff that I try to include in my artwork. And if you've ever seen some of the artwork I'm doing for Breast Gladiators, definitely influenced by uh, Project Aiko. Project Aiko to me is what anime is supposed to look and sound like. <laughs> I love modern anime, but stylistically, they really just can't capture that feeling you get from 80s anime. The designs in 80s anime are always unique and always interesting looking. There's always really cool rendering on the mechs, and I love the use of color and the simple use of score in the scenes. I love the fact that they use a kind of simple synthesizer. All of this creates this very unique feel that I do feel like is kind of missing in a lot of modern anime. And speaking of the music to Project Ego, I think the music in Project Ego is really cool. It was actually produced in America by American composer Joey Carbone. And the score is awesome. It's a mix of like 80s synths and bluesy guitars. And like I said, I really love the visuals. I love the sound of Project Ego. Like watching Project Ego, I have this huge smile on my face. It just hits you all in the right places. And it's like, yes, this is perfect. <laughs> Everything about this is awesome. The great animation is also not just limited to the action sequences. There are a couple of little moments that really stand out to me. I love this sequence of Aiko running back and forth, mopping the floor. There's just something about the way she runs that looks so cool. And I love this sequence where Aiko is running to save Seiko, the way the camera zooms in and the motion shifts. Like this movie just looks so awesome. It's also worth mentioning that Discotech Media was planning a re-release of Project Aiko that they canceled. And the reason they canceled it is because they found the original 35 millimeter print. Project Echo. Every version of Project Echo that has come out so far has been from the original video transfer that they did back in the 80s. So the quality hasn't been great. The original 35 millimeter print for Project Echo was originally thought to be lost, but it turns out it was actually misplaced. And Robert Woodhead, who was one of the uh, co-founders of Anime Ego, he was actually the person that noticed the clerical error that misplaced Project Echo. And because of him, the archivists were then able to find the original 35 millimeter print. Print. So Discotech Media is now planning a completely new restored version of Project Echo, and it looks awesome. The YouTube channel Ashora uploaded some clips from the Project Echo 35 millimeter print, and it looks amazing. I recommend everybody go and check out this person's YouTube channel. I'll have a link to it in the description of this video. But I'm looking forward to seeing a new pristine Blu-ray release of Project Echo. I normally am not too excited with anime HD re-releases. I actually like anime to be a little fuzzy. I mean, it's probably just because I grew up watching anime on VHS. So anime in HD looks weird to me most of the time, but this looks awesome. I mean, I love seeing this animation in its full detail. It looks great. I'm really looking forward to checking out Discotech Media's re-release when it does come out. At this moment, I don't believe there's a date for it, but I'll keep you guys informed and I'll let you know when one is released. But in closing, let me say Project Ego is an awesome film and it's definitely one of the classics of the golden age of anime. 
me. Definitely one of the classics of the 1980s, and I recommend everybody goes and check this out. I don't know that any anime today really compares to the just bonkers, batshit craziness of Project Echo because none of it makes any sense. There's nothing in the show that makes any sense, but the show does not care. The show is unapologetically stupid, and that's what makes it so great. Project Echo certainly accepts the fact that it's ridiculous and over the top, and I think you guys will have a lot of fun checking it out, and I recommend it. We are not done talking about Project Echo because, you see, there are actually three sequels to Project Echo and two spin-off films. Project Echo has fallen out of popularity over the years, but back in the day, it was actually a very well-known and popular anime. It's a shame that Project Echo has been flying under the radar in recent years. If I accomplish anything in my life, and if this channel could stand for anything, it's going to be my mission to try to bring Project Echo back to mainstream anime discourse and try to make sure it gets the appreciation it deserves. This week's question comes from Teraxel, who asks, Hey Chojin, just wanted to know what your thoughts are on exploitation type movies, and if you ever thought about reviewing one. Thank you, Teraxel, for sending in a question. I really like exploitation movies. Um, movies like I Spit on Your Grave, I Drink Your Blood, Ilsa, She-Wolf of the SS. I think those movies are all really cool. I love how unapologetically offensive they are, and how they are willing to go places mainstream films are not willing to go. And I think there's a lot of value in those movies. And definitely, I will definitely be talking about them down the line because as the channel grows, I want to do different kinds of content. I want to talk about different kinds of things. But yes, I definitely do want to talk about exploitation movies. I love the fact that Tarantino and Rob Rodriguez tried to bring them back with Grindhouse. I really loved Grindhouse. I thought Planet Terror was really cool. I love the Machete movies. Death Proof was fine. <laughs> You know, it was okay. I mean, it's growing on me. I really didn't care for it when I first watched it, but the more I watch it now, the more I'm learning to appreciate it. Kurt Russell was really great as Stuntman Mike in that film. And another thing I love about exploitation movies is the fact that exploitation movies kind of single-handedly invented the 80s slasher genre. If it wasn't for directors like Wes Craven and movies like Last House on the Left and The Hills Have Eyes, we wouldn't have gotten the slasher boom we got in the 80s. So it really is impossible to talk about those films without exploring exploitation cinema. And exploitation cinema really does go beyond America, because even in Japan, they have their own exploitation films with the uh, pink movies and the kind of over-the-top gore movies, that whole, like, V cinema releases they used to do in Japan. There is a lot to talk about with uh, exploitation films, but yes, we will be talking about it, and uh, thank you for sending in a question. If you have any suggestions about exploitation movies you'd like to hear me talk talk about, send them my way and I'd be happy to review them on the channel. So if you have a question or a comment or you'd like to complain about something, feel free to uh, send me an email at studiochojin at gmail.com. Make the subject raw and I will be happy to read it on a future edition of this show. So, once again, that wraps up this week's edition of Studio Chojin Raw. I hope you enjoyed the video, and I want to urge you to join the Unholy Army of the Night and subscribe to the channel. You could also support the channel by liking the video, leaving a comment. I have a coffee account if you feel so inclined to donate to coffee. I'm an independent artist. I'm an independent content creator. I will be self-publishing a comic book very, very soon. Um, and if you'd like to support an independent artist and an independent content creator like myself, you could always donate to the coffee account, or you could support the channel by sending good vibes and continuing to watch the video. So with all that said, this is Reverend Paul saying until we meet again.